Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Seriously. Anyway, back in April, the day I took my advanced Psalm theory exam, I traveled to Austin for a Texas Hill Country wineries tasting. The first couple hours was a trade only tasting, then they opened it to the general public afterwards. There were over 30 different wineries there. I think I hit all but one table. I don't know. Yes, I spit like 90% of the wines because, well, you have to if you're going to try that many wines. I got to see a lot of my old friends and acquaintances in the industry that day. I also got to check out quite a few wineries that were either fairly new or at least new to me. Like any collection of wineries, there was a range of quality, but most of it was at least good to very good quality wines. One of the local PR firms knew I was coming to the event, and they wanted me to specifically stop by one of their clients, Texas Heritage Vineyard. This is a relatively new winery, having been established in 2015. I got to try a couple of their wines, but they specifically wanted me to try these two that I'm trying today. I didn't taste these as per my usual policy of not pre-tasting wines that I review. Let's get into their background, shall we? The owners are Billy and Susan Johnson. Susan's family has been in Texas since the 1830s, so effectively since the beginning. Susan and Billy decided to move to Fredericksburg from Austin in 2002, where they planted a three-acre lavender field. In 2013, Jessica retired from her day job at State Farm Insurance and enrolled in the Texas Tech Viticulture Program. Tech has a campus extension in Fredericksburg specifically to help people to get into the wine industry. It's been great seeing people I know go through the program without having to commit to being in Lubbock full-time, where the main campus is. Anyway, in 2015, Susan and Billy planted their first grapes and continued to plant more over the years. They currently have 12.5 acres under vine of several varieties, Alicante Boucher, Malbec, Tempranillo, Tanat, Suzanne, and Viognier. While some of these may not sound familiar, they are all well suited to Texas. In addition to making wines from their 12.5 acre estate, they also make quite a few wines from vineyards around Texas. In 2017, they built the actual winery and the tasting room opened in 2018, just east of Fredericksburg. Now they are two different buildings in two different locations. I do not know where the winery is. I did try to find it though. It's become a family affair with their children and grandchildren contributing to the operation of the winery. Susan is also the assistant winemaker, with Tyler Budemeyer being the main winemaker. These two wines come from two vineyards they source grapes from, one in the Texas Hill Country and the other in the Texas High Plains. They are a 100% Texas winery. That means they don't source grapes from outside the state. With over 900 bonded wineries in the state and barely 10,000 acres, well, depending on whose numbers you're using, we don't currently have enough acreage under vine that's viable to supply that many wineries with a lot of grapes, with, you know, more than just a few tons here and there for some of these wineries. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of wineries that are 100% Texas fruit, just that there are also a lot of wineries that supplement their supply to meet demand. This is very common outside of California, Oregon, Washington State, New York. They, they supplement this with, with grapes from California. I'm excited to try these as these are two grapes that I'm particularly fond of. Let's get the stats for these wines. First up, the 2022 Texas Heritage Vineyard Viognier retail is $28. It's from the Texas Hill Country AVA from Wild Seed Farms Vineyard. Now I've driven by this place dozens of times. They have more than just grapes. Grape is Viognier, no percentage, but very likely 100% because that's pretty much what it would be. 320 cases made, or 3,840 bottles. The ABV is 11.7%. And second, the 2019 Texas Heritage Vineyard Carmenere retails for $38. It's from the Texas High Plains AVA, from the Nada Vineyards. It's Carmenere. Now, like the Viognier, I'm guessing it's 100%. It's, they made 261 cases, or 3,132 bottles, and the ABV is 13.2%. When I wrote this script, the wine had not been added to their website, as in the Carmenere. 
I had to contact the winery for the retail price. It should be on their site by the time you see this episode. As you can see, both wines are very small production. Essentially 10 to 12 barrels of each, one 225 liter barrel can make up to 25 cases of wine. Though I don't know if either of these wines see any oak, especially the Viognier. This small production also helps explain the prices. Wineries of this size don't have the luxury of economies of scale, so it can be a major hurdle for the general public to understand why wines like these are, quote, expensive versus their higher production, like thousands of cases, counterparts elsewhere in the country or even the world. Now, also to, to contribute to the expensive prices or higher prices you, you, you find with these wines and other Texas wines is that Texas wines or Texas grapes are expensive. We don't really have very many, if at all, grapes that sell for under $1,000 a ton. Um, they usually are selling for $1,500 to $2,000 a ton, and you, you can't make $10 bottles of wine with those grapes. Now, with that said, there are wines that can make wines that are 15 bucks, maybe even lower than that, but they either are owners of the vineyard um, or they have long-term contracts with uh, the vineyards that they do source from. So they are getting good pricing for their grapes. All right, so let's get into the wines. All right, so the Viognier, uh, this has been out for probably 45 minutes, not quite an hour. So it's warmed up a little bit, but which means it also should be a really great temperature to taste everything. No pressure. All righty. You know, it's funny. I probably had more Texas Viognier than Viognier from any other part of the world. Seriously. So as far as Texas Viognier, I'm pretty familiar with what it normally tastes like. Um, I've had some California Viognier here and there. Um, it tastes about the same. And then French Viognier, again, it tastes the same, but there is a bit of a difference to it. Um, specifically for my exams, um, we don't have, uh, we don't, they don't allow California Viognier anymore. Probably because they acidify the you know what out of it. Um, with that said, Texas usually acidifies Viognier. Texas usually acidifies wines in general because they, for the most part, at harvest or the soils themselves, um, or at harvest, the grape pH is usually high, like uppers of 4, 4.0, which is very high for, for grapes as far as pH, which means the acidity is actually pretty low. but it does smell a little oxidized. Let's, let's move on to the red wine. All right, so uh, we've got, you know, kind of a medium plus, not quite deep ruby color. Uh, extends all the way out, uh, similar color, but it's just kind of a little bit lesser color. We've got medium, medium, medium minus staining on the glass. Um, there is a bit of, I would say, it's all ruby pretty much, but a little bit of red. No, the death, yeah, just red ruby all the way throughout. Oh, I didn't talk about, no, I'm not gonna worry about it. All right, on the nose. Okay, so this may have seen smoke, maybe. Now this is 19, so it's got a little bit of age to it. It may have sat in a barrel for a year. All right, so right off the bat, I'm getting the black fruit and the red fruits, but I'm, red fruits, but I'm also getting Pyrazine. I'm getting that bell pepper thing, which Carbonair is a characteristic of. Now, this is something that can be ripened out. Um, and I've had, I have a bunch of Carbonair from Chile I'm going to be doing soon. So I'm hoping that most of that has it in there. It also has a little bit of that cumin, a little bit of that enchilada thing, which is for me a big, big like marker for Carbonair over any other grape variety, you know, the Bordeaux varieties that have this Pyrazine type of thing going on. Yes, blackberry, more than anything else, black raspberry, touch of raspberry, a little bit of strawberry. They're riper in nature, but I also smell oak usage. So I get 
I get vanilla on this, a little bit of clove, cinnamon. Yeah. I also get a bit of sage on this, a little bit of herbaceousness. Yeah, I mean, this, this wine smells really good. All right, let's just go and taste it. This wine's juicy. So not knowing what this was, if I was like Carmenere was in my, on my short list, along with Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, if it was on my short list, I'd be like, this is New World wine. I just, and that would, then being, a, if it was an exam, would be Chile, because that's the only place I can have this style of wine from the New World. I would not peg this as an Old World wine. So no Bordeaux. Besides, they don't really make Carmenere specific wines in Bordeaux, or at least not that are testable. Um, this is delicious. Um, the fruit is ripe. It's juicy. It's blackberry. It's black raspberry, a little bit of plum. The, the pyrazine is great in balance. You know, again, it's just like a touch of bell pepper, like a little bit of enchilada thing. This would be great with enchiladas. It's great because you can get that, you get that little bell pepper enchilada thing on the retronasal. My mouth is watering. So it's, like this, this wine did not make my mouth water. So they may have not acidified this. So yeah, it's possible. Or they didn't, they didn't raise the pH or they didn't lower the pH that much. Um, it would be interesting to see what the pH was on this wine. This tastes, oh, okay. I'm not gonna say it tastes acidified, but it's bright. My mouth is watering. So the acid on this is elevated. Um, and not that Carmenere is a high acid grape, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's really juicy. It tastes really good. If I was going to have one critique, I think the acid is just a little, little too high, but alcohol wise, both wines, alcohol wise are great. You're not, you don't have this big bruiser hitting you in the face, you know, and considering, you know, how hot it can get in Texas and how easy it is to ripe grapes in Texas. Um, you would think that we're getting 14, five, 15%. Well, here's the thing about, uh, heat. I'm going to taste more of that. Mm. I like this wine a lot. Um, here's the thing about heat and grapes above 95 degrees or so, the vine shuts down. So there's no ripening going on anyway. So when you see these reports of we have like 40 days in a row of a hundred plus degree temperatures, you know what's going on in the vineyard? Nothing. Okay. Maybe a little bit, but in general, it's not, it, if anything's going on, dehydration's going on. All right. Because what happens is the, the, the leaves is where all the respiration happens. They shut down. They close off because they don't want to lose any moisture. Um, so dehydration is probably going on. And then, then as the heat drops, they start respirating again. But um, yeah, this wine is delicious. So it's possible, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, it is possible that this was high in acid naturally. Um, because of some dehydration, they might've been, you know, the, the sugars go up, but the acid maybe is retained. I would have to ask an ex expert on this. I don't know, but I do like the wine a lot. Unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the Viognier and I really don't want to give a Texas, especially when I've been handed the wineries by the, the wines from the owners directly. Um, I really don't like saying I don't particularly care for wine. Um, I think this is a, home run. I think this wine is fantastic. Uh, the Viognier, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uncertain. Okay. The Carmenere, I think is fantastic. I really like the Carmenere. So, um, good job on it. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, this is a winery that's new, uh, new wineries go through growing, growing pains. Some wines are hits. Some wines are not even established wineries maybe have wines that are kind of like, oh, okay, maybe not, or maybe not for everybody. It might be like, you know, for some people it's like a home run and other people it's like, I'm not so much. I think Whereas this wine is, you know, the, the Carmenere is more of a general purpose, a good red wine that's got a little bit of, a little bit of bell pepper to it that you can put with a lot of different things. I think. Anyway, um, that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell all your friends and we'll see you next time.